Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to News Dose. And while everybody's currently talking about the latest and greatest Bethesda RPG, Starfield, well, Bethesda as a whole has had a pretty good year, even beyond just that, with new games like Ghostwire Tokyo and Hi Fi Rush. In fact, in many ways, Hi Fi Rush has proven to be immensely important for Bethesda going forward, which is something that they just confirmed themselves. So I'm going to explain why here in just a little bit and how they're going to take more risks going forward. And then for you Pikmin fans out there, I come pairing good news because the future is looking brighter than ever before. As always though, we do have a lot to get into, so let's just go and jump right into it, starting off with Spyro. As much as I think the Pikmin franchise has a very bright future, again we'll get into that in just a little bit, but so too does the Spyro franchise, and that was further cemented today. As part of its 25th anniversary, Man, that, that makes me feel old, but uh, Activision just announced that Spyro Reignited has officially surpassed 10 million units sold worldwide. And that, that is actually astounding. These are old 3D platformers, and there, there's often questions about how successful these type of games can be in modern day times. But there you go. There's obviously still a huge fan base that wants these type of games. 10 million copies sold? That is a massive milestone that very few games can achieve. The thing is, we just don't really get a lot of these type of games at this high of quality very often. But either way, Activision, uh, they've already had success with Crash Bandicoot and now with Spyro as well. That does kind of beg the question though, what about Spyro 4? The Crash and Saints trilogy was followed up with Crash 4, so what about Spyro? I mean, surely, with this amount of success, you would think that Activision would at least be considering if they're not already working on it. I mean, let's just kind of hope that they are, uh, maybe with a soonish announcement that would be even better. Uh, but either way, big congrats to Activision and fans alike. This is great news for the future of Spyro. I mean, even if Activision isn't already working on it, there's also a possibility that Xbox might want to come in and change that if they complete the acquisition. A new Spyro game would look really good in Xbox Game Pass. Variety is very important for a service like that. Moving on though, we got another update for the PlayStation Portal, the modern acronym PSP. I, I know not quite the evolution for their handheld consoles that fans were maybe hoping for. I mean, myself, I loved the Vita, but I, I still think that this is an interesting device, albeit just very niche. I, I do wonder how this thing is going to sell in the grand scheme of things, but at the very least, we now have an official release date. It is slated for November 15th and pre-orders are live as we speak. They actually went up yesterday on PlayStation Direct, but with its tepid response, it still hasn't sold out. You can still pre-order it as of this recording for $200. In fact, I actually just pre-ordered it earlier today. Maybe I'll give some impressions when I try it out myself, but I really wouldn't be surprised if the response for this thing exceeds expectations. Now, the expectations are pretty low, to be fair, but I mean, I've heard some good things about the PlayStation Portal so far, but if it proves to be a better experience than using your phone for remote play, then I, I could see its interest grow over time. Uh, but yes, I, I believe its reviews will definitely be important. Now, if you are still on the fence, though, definitely wait for those reviews. I completely understand that. But again, if you are interested, it is set to release on November 15th. Okay, so let's just go and talk about Bethesda here. They've had mostly a good year. Redfall, that didn't exactly meet expectations. We all know that. But outside of that game, uh, they released Ghostwire Tokyo on Xbox. They shadow launched Hi-Fi Rush. And then, of course, as everybody knows, they just launched Starfield into Early Access, which has... I don't know if you've all been paying attention, it's already reached 234,000 concurrent players on Steam. And that's just for its premium early access edition that, that is just crazy but yeah that xbox acquisition is starting to pay off in big ways at least two of these games are legitimate game of the year candidates i, I do expect both games to win at least some awards but uh here's the thing hi-fi rush is a very interesting game it's different it's unique and it's unexpected it was developed by tango gameworks and that shocked everybody you know, this is a studio that's known for horror games like The Evil Within. You know, you have Shinji Mikami, the director, and he's the creative mind behind Resident Evil. So nobody's expecting a game like Hi-Fi Rush, but Bethesda as a publisher, 
they allowed them to try something different. This is a risk because you don't know what's going to happen. This was not what their fan base expected or requested. And at the time, it was a complete unknown if they can actually have success with a completely different genre. They, they've not really done this up to this point. Now, in hindsight, of course, we now know that Hi-Fi Rush has been a huge success. Uh, but my point is, is that it was a huge risk for them and the risk paid off. Well, Pete Hines, the vice president for Bethesda, spoke out in this in an interview, and let's just check out what he had to say. So he said, The relationship with our studios is always evolving. One of the things that I hope people take away from a game like Hi-Fi Rush is that as a company, we're willing to work with the developers and take risks with things that you would never believe could come from that studio. When you think of Tango, you think they make horror games, and suddenly comes a really bright, colorful, and fun music action game. Part of the reason we released it by surprise is that we didn't want to spend three months explaining to people why we made this game, why these horror game people were doing something different. It seems so much easier to announce it, let them play it, and not have to ask us. It didn't make much sense when you could just make it available to a huge audience. Also, Tango learned that this type of thing works, that there is a large audience for this type of game. We did very well in Game Pass with the number of players and how many copies we sold. That reinforces us that taking risks and supporting developers who want to do something new or different is always a good thing. And it's that last part that is so important here. Hi-Fi Rush's success has reinforced Bethesda to take more risks in the future. Now, I personally find that to be very exciting. I think we need more interesting new ideas in the gaming industry, and it's, it's exciting when you see these big publishers sign on for that type of project. But there's a little bit more to this quote as well, because he also mentioned that success is part thanks to Xbox Game Pass. Xbox Game Pass was actually the reason that they did the Shadow launch in the first place. He kind of suggested that here. But more so, it's very interesting to see this marriage between Xbox and Bethesda. Something that Phil Spencer has really emphasized with his studios is creative freedom. This is exactly why games like Grounded and Pentiment exist in the way that they do today. These studios are free to create what they truly want to, and because they have Xbox Game Pass at their disposal, this gives them an opportunity to reach millions of gamers immediately. As Pete Hines says, it gave them an opportunity to reach this large audience right out of the gate. Obsidian once said that Pentiment, which was very well received, they mentioned that that game would not have existed without Xbox Game Pass. So it's interesting to see Hi-Fi Rush, another unique game, come in and have success and then have Bethesda basically say, this ensures we as a company will take more risks in the future. And that's exciting when you have studios like Tango Gameworks, which has really proven that they are a very creative studio. And it's just going to be interesting to see what else they can come up with. And not just them, but also id Software, you have Machine Games, and all these other Bethesda studios. It'll be interesting to see if any of these other studios comes to the plate with some creative new ideas, because with the addition of Xbox Game Pass, it just really completely opens up the possibilities of what these studios can create. Now for you Pikmin fans out there, like I said, I do have some good news for you all as well because Nintendo is already suggesting that Pikmin 5 could be on the way and maybe the wait won't be quite as long this time. This is from a Eurogamer interview where they asked a Nintendo veteran executive, Takashi Tezuka, on if Nintendo would ensure the next Pikmin wouldn't take another 10 years. And his response was, quote unquote, I think that would be best as well. We'll try not to let everyone wait. Now, that's not necessarily confirmation per se, but it is a good sign. And I, I, I just think from what we already know, the Pikmin franchise has probably risen in the ranks of Nintendo IP. Pikmin 4 has by far been their most successful Pikmin launch to date, and it's been topping the charts pretty much since it first released. It's been selling extraordinarily well, especially over in Japan, and it just feels like it's finally getting the recognition that it truly deserves. See, that's the thing about the Pikmin IP. These games have always been good. There's no doubt about that. But they've also lived in obscurity. They, they really haven't gotten that worldwide recognition that other Nintendo games have. 
But that's where the Switch kind of comes in. I mean, we always like to talk about the Switch effect. It seems like it makes every Nintendo franchise sell better. But I mean, if you look at the Pikmin franchise specifically, this is the first game that launched on a highly successful console. The first two games, they launched on a GameCube. And as much as I love the GameCube personally, it's one of my favorite consoles ever made. But however, it wasn't exactly a blazing success. Then there was Pikmin 3, and that launched on the Wii U. I don't think that we really need to say much else here, uh, but Pikmin 4, this was the first brand new Pikmin game to launch on a highly successful Nintendo console, and look at it go, it's reached new heights. But yeah, even if there's no confirmation in this interview per se, I think that it's only logical. We're going to see more Pikmin in the future, and we likely aren't going to have to wait another 10 years. And Nintendo is probably going to want to re-up this franchise for their next console. And I think that that's what's going to be really interesting here. The Pikmin series could really take advantage of the Switch successor's extra power with its realistic environment. So I think this is going to be pretty cool to see on that next console when it eventually happens. Now, for a last topic, and this is unfortunate, but after 30 years, Volition, the studio behind Saints Row and Red Faction, just shut down. Yeah, this is never something that you want to talk about, but uh, they did attempt to reboot Saints Row last year, a way for them to kind of launch the series into a new era and see if they can get the ball rolling for more entries down the road. Uh, but it, it just wasn't the success that they were hoping for. It was widely viewed as not a very good game. It scored a 61 overall score on Metacritic, but even then, I don't think anybody wanted them to shut down. I mean, sure, fans wanted them to make better games, but sadly, they're no longer going to have that opportunity, which is a, a sad reality to the gaming business. AAA games are always risky to make, and a, a failure can completely sink a company, and you might not get a second chance as you're seeing here. Now, to be fair, I don't think that they've had a lot of success for a long time, which probably played a part in the decision by their parent company, the Embracer Group. But it is still a sad situation. You never want to see people lose their jobs. And Volition, I mean, they were a pretty storied studio, so, you know, there's connection with fans. Even for myself, I actually have very fond memories of the first Saints Row on the Xbox 360. Back then, I thought it was a fun take on the open-world formula that GTA made so popular during that generation, and... While I can't necessarily say that I like the direction that they eventually took, I did genuinely enjoy that first game. I also know that there's a lot of Red Faction fans out there as well. So yeah, it's just a sad situation for fans and the studio alike. You just never really want to talk about this thing. At the same time though, you do have to kind of wonder about the Embracer Group right now. They've acquired a lot of studios in the last few years, but they recently said that they were looking to restructure and Volition's closure was a part of that restructuring. So you do have to kind of wonder what's happening behind the scenes over there and whether or not there's going to be more major shifts within the company. Let's go take a look at the poll of the day that we're asked you all with PlayStation Plus increasing in price. Do you plan on renewing your subscription? And yeah, the results here seem to echo some of that backlash that we've seen online. Only 9% of you voted yes, whereas 38% voted no. And then 45% of you said that you're currently not subscribed. And that's really interesting because I, I know for a fact that there's going to be people that drop PlayStation Plus because of this price hike. I mean, with any price hike, you're going to have some people that drops off. But with a dramatic price hike, yeah, there's going to be some people that leaves. But then the main question just kind of becomes, will the price hike balance out the people who are leaving? In other words, as long as not too many people leave, they can have less subscribers and still make more money because it is such a dramatic price increase. So it'll be interesting to see how widespread this backlash is and whether or not people actually vote with their wallets. I mean, I certainly don't think that Sony has justified these new price tags. Again, we can come back to this topic if Sony starts to include more day one games. But as of right now, and that's all I can really base this off of, but right now, I don't think that they've justified the prices of any of these tiers. So, I do understand why people are frustrated about this situation. I mean, I myself, I'm certainly not going to pay that money. But, I mean, I, I guess we'll just kind of see how this plays out. Maybe Sony backtracks eventually. We saw Xbox kind of backtrack on their, their Xbox Live Gold price a few years back. But, that's really up to fans to vote with their wallet. If fans pay then it only reassures Sony that they've made the right decision. So it's really up to the consumers here on whether or not they are going to go along for the ride or not. Anyways, though, that's it for this episode. But if you like the video, don't forget to bell notification and subscribe button for more content just like this. Also, if you'd like to support the channel through Patreon, 
Thank you for making this content possible. Peace out.